Today is January 7th, 2024. I want to begin by wishing everyone out there who celebrates a very Merry Orthodox Christmas that is observed on January 7th versus uh, Christmas observed by others on December 25th. I want to continue focusing on the ongoing U.S. proxy war in Ukraine against Russia. I want to first begin by looking at the live map. This is liveuamap.com. It is a pro-Ukrainian map, so please keep that in mind when we look at it. And again, as you can see, day to day now for several days, Russia continues carrying out missile and drone strikes all across Ukraine. After months of stockpiling huge numbers of missiles, looking at the line of contact, we can see Russian military activity all along the line of contact. Ukraine is on the defensive. We look at Adevka outside of Donetsk city in the Donbas region, and we can see Russian forces continuing to tighten their grip around that heavily fortified city. And we see fighting elsewhere along the line of contact. And I just want to remind people that this concept of Ukraine going on the defensive, digging in, this is not going to work. Ukraine has had heavily fortified defenses all along the line of contact since 2014. Uh, when Russia turns its attention toward a particular fortified city along the front line, they are able to encircle it, cut it off, and uh, eliminate the Ukrainian military presence there. That is what they're doing. They, and they will continue maintaining pressure all along the line of contact. Uh, and uh, as Ukrainian military capabilities are eroded, including through these deep strikes by uh, Russian missiles and drones, as their military capabilities decrease and Russian military uh, power increases, we are going to see Russian operations along the line of contact become increasingly effective. And eventually we will see breakthroughs and uh, both local and general collapses of Ukrainian fighting capacity. That, that is an inevitability. But for the time being, I would expect uh, pressure, Russia maintaining pressure all along the line of contact to continue we wearing out Ukrainian forces through a, a campaign of attrition. Now getting back to these missile attacks, uh, I and other analysts had said that Russian missile production was much larger than the West had presumed, and it was increasing. These claims that Russia was about to run out of missiles any month or over the last two years, we've heard claims even coming from the, the British government, British military uh, officials, American military officials. Russian missile strikes have continued and they have grown larger over time. They're, they are obviously able to make missiles to keep up with the tempo of their missile attacks. These missile attacks that we are now seeing are larger than anything before, and that is because not only are they increasing the number of missiles they make month to month, they also spent several months stockpiling them. And I wanna take a look at the, the media, the Western media, how they are reacting to these strikes and what the, the collective West is considering doing in response to these strikes. This is from The Guardian, uh, January 5th, 2024. Fears Russia using North Korea supply ballistic missiles to attack Ukraine, Washington and Kiev claim Moscow turning to other states under sanctions to sustain its war efforts. And while we have heard this claim before, Regarding everything from artillery shells to drones, we know that Russia is cooperating with its partners, but is bringing in novel weapon systems, uh, adapting them to uh, their needs amid the special military operation, building their own factories to mass produce these weapons. The article says, Russia has started using ballistic missiles supplied by North Korea to attack Ukraine, Washington and Kiev have claimed in an indication that Moscow plans to further expand its arms deals with regimes under sanctions in order to sustain its war effort. Washington also alleged Russia was in talks with Iran to buy short range ballistic missiles. The US intelligence assessments that Iranian missiles have not yet arrived in Russia, that the deal will eventually be done. And again, we're talking about 
missile systems that have been developed over a number of years that are proven on the battlefield that Russia will bring into its own military industrial uh, network and then be in mass producing and adapting and modifying for its own needs. The report may or may not be true. We don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. This article continues by saying John Kirby, uh, the U.S.'s National Security Council spokesperson, argued that Moscow's foreign arms acquisition should serve as a reminder to Congress of the costs of its failure to pass a Ukraine arms supply package before Christmas. I, I, how would that have dissuaded Russia from continuing to, to expand its military uh, production and expand its military cooperation with its allies. How, how would that have dissuaded Russia? It wouldn't have. It also says, Russia is relying upon its friends to be able to restore its military stockpiles and enable its war against Ukraine, Kirby said. Iran and North Korea are standing with Russia. Ukrainians deserve to know that the American people and this government will continue to stand with them. So it's critical that Congress meets this moment and responds by providing Ukraine with what they need to defend themselves. The time for Congress to act is now. Even if this money was supplied to Ukraine, it would make absolutely no difference. The problem isn't a, a supply of money, although uh, cutting off money will create additional problems. The primary problem Ukraine has is a lack of firepower. All of the money in the world will do you no good if the actual weapons and ammunition you need simply do not exist to buy in the first place. Now, Alexander Mikuras of the Duran, in a recent video, and I have included a link to that video in the, the video description below, was talking about how this narrative of North Korean ballistic missiles, Iranian ballistic missiles being used by Russia in the special military operation, this could be part of a public relations campaign to create support for or a pretext to supply Ukraine with longer range missiles. And I'm talking about cruise missiles with much longer ranges that could uh, strike deep within Russia itself. This would be crossing the West's own self-imposed red lines. This is a, another point Alexander Mikuras made in his video, uh, but the West has crossed many of their own red lines before, and that includes uh, red lines involving sending main battle tanks to Ukraine, Western main battle tanks, warplanes, and other long-range missiles like ATACMS and the Storm Shadow and Scalp air launch cruise missiles, which have already been sent, none of which are making any sort of strategic difference on the battlefield, I should add. Now, the first hint of this uh, idea that the, the West is trying to find a way to justify sending longer range missiles. Uh, we can see these efforts taking shape in news reports like this. This is from Kiev Post. Poland urges long range missiles for Ukraine following deadly strikes. Poland's top diplomat, Radoslav Sikorsky, said on social media that the West should respond in a language that Putin understands. And the article explains. Uh, the F Polish foreign minister called on allies to deliver long-range missiles to Ukraine to help Kiev target launch sites and command centers amid a new wave of Russian attacks. So in response to these massive Russian missile and drone attacks. A barrage of deadly missile strikes hit residential buildings in Ukraine's capital of Kiev and the northeastern city of Kharkiv with five dead and dozens of civilians wounded. Now, if they were actually hitting civilian buildings deliberately, that that number of casualties would be astronomically higher. And just remember, the source of this information is the Kiev Post. Poland's top diplomat, Radoslav Sikorsky, said on social media that the West should respond in a language Putin understands. He urged allies to provide Kiev with long-range missiles that will enable it to take out launch sites and command centers, again, deep inside Russian territory. But how realistic is this option? Will this make any difference if the West fully commits to a strategy of sending all of its long-range weapons to Ukraine without limits, without limits on Ukraine as to where they can use them within uh, territory Ukraine claims is their territory or even beyond those borders deep into Russia? First, let's talk about how many missiles Ukraine would actually need just to match 
the scale of Russian missile and drone strikes. Let's look at this Reuters article from December 2023. Russia has fired 7,400 missiles, 3,700 Shahid drones in war so far, Kiev says. And Shahid refers to the Garan 2 drones that Russia has been using in between and in lieu of missiles for, for the months that they were stockpiling missiles. They, they have a huge number of these drones, and they are constantly using them against targets all across Ukraine. Now, the article says Russia has launched about 7,400 missiles and 3,700 Shahid attack drones at, at targets in Ukraine during its 22-month-old invasion, Kiev said, illustrating the vast scale of Moscow's aerial assaults. And by the way, also illustrating the vast scale of Russia's military industrial base. Ukrainian air defenses were able to shoot down 1,600 of the missiles and 2,900 of the drones, Air Force spokesperson Yuri Inat said in a televised comment. We are faced with an enormous aggressor and we are fighting back, he said. He said the lower missile downing rate was due to the use of supersonic ballistic missiles, which are a lot harder to hit, as well as the fact that the West supplied Ukraine with advanced Patriot air defense systems only well into the war. Ukraine has received advanced air defense systems, including several Patriots from Western allies throughout the invasion, allowing it to shoot down more missiles, which is not true. And a lot of these Western supplied air defense systems have been targeted and destroyed. There's also a serious problem with a lack of interceptors to be launched by these systems. Critical shortages that existed even before the U.S. decided to send them to Ukraine, where they are being used on an unprecedented scale. So this is, an, this is a massive amount of missiles that Russia is firing uh, at Ukraine um, day to day, month to month, year by year, huge amounts of missiles. To put that into perspective, let's look at this from Raytheon. This is their official website. This is their Tomahawk cruise missile webpage. And uh, they talk about how powerful it is. Tried and true U.S. and allied militaries have flight tested the GPS-enabled Tomahawk 550 times and used it in combat more than 2,300 times. Its most recent use came in 2018 when U.S. Navy warships and submarines launched 66 Tomahawk missiles at Syria at Syrian chemical weapons facilities, which did not exist. So I don't know what they were launching their cruise missiles at, but just put that in perspective to the 7,400 missiles that Russia has launched at Ukraine over the course of just the last uh, two years. The US has never used missiles on the scale that Russia is using them on. They couldn't, they couldn't sustain that rate of fire. Their military industrial base would not enable that. It is incapable of sustaining that rate of fire. And speaking of Russian military industrial output, remember this article from September 2023 from the New York Times, Russia overcomes sanctions to expand missile production. Officials say Moscow's missile production now exceeds pre-war levels. Officials say leaving Ukraine especially vulnerable this coming winter. It also says Russia is on track to manufacture 2 million artillery shells a year, double the amount Western intelligence services had initially estimated Russia could manufacture before the war. That number is most likely even higher. As a result of the push, Russia is now producing more ammunition than the United States and Europe. Overall, Kusti Salm, a senior Estonian defense ministry official, estimated that Russia's current ammunition production is seven times greater than that of the West the US and Europe, all of Europe combined. And keep in mind that even these much larger levels of production in Russia are constantly being expanded even further. And then this New York Times article explains how this production increase is a major problem and what little the West can actually do in response to it. It says, Russia's re-energized military production is especially worrisome because Moscow has used artillery to pound Ukrainian soldiers on the front lines and its missiles to attack the electric grid and other critical infrastructure and to terrorize civilians in cities. They just add that in with no evidence at all 
to substantiate that claim. Officials fear that increased missile stocks could mean an especially dark and cold winter for Ukrainian citizens. So they're, they were writing this in September. They were talking about the period that we're in right now where Russia is now indeed uh, restarting a major missile strike campaign. In the meantime, the Pentagon is working to find ways to help Ukrainians better take down the missiles and drones fired by Russia at civilian targets in Kiev and military targets around the country. The Pentagon has provided Patriot air defense systems and congealed allies to provide S-300 air defense ammunition, both of which have proven effective. It has provided other air defense systems like the Avenger system and the Hawk air defense system, both of which are entirely inadequate for this type of conflict. The Hawk air defense system is antiquated. It's not been used by the U.S. Uh, for decades now. That, that is where the U.S. is at. That is how desperate they are. They are pulling uh, weapon systems and ammunition out of deep storage, things that should be in a museum. But Ukraine does not have enough air defense systems to cover the entire country, even after the West uh, has begun supplying them with Western systems and must pick the sites it defends. An increased barrage of missiles could overwhelm the country's air defenses, Ukrainian officials said. So it could. Now we see uh, Russian missile barrages now in reality, in fact, right now overwhelming Ukrainian air defenses, not just destroying the targets that Russia has set out to target, uh, but also destroying the air defense systems themselves, uh, overwhelming them, uh, forcing them to expend uh, interceptors that are scarce, and also targeting and destroying the radars, uh, command centers, and launchers. Ukraine does not have enough air defense systems to cope with this growing number of Russian missile and drone uh, strikes being carried out, they will never have enough air defense systems to cope with this growing missile and drone threat. But now we have this, this idea that while we struggle to defend against these missile and drone strikes, we will start launching long-range missile strikes at Russia. Uh, but considering all of this that I just talked about, does anyone seriously think that the West can even match Russia's volume of missile and drone strikes, let alone exceed it. And you have to keep in mind that Russia's military industrial base is many times larger than Ukraine's. It is spread out over a much larger uh, land area, Russia being the largest nation on earth in terms of land area. Its infrastructure is more extensive and again, more widely distributed uh, even its military is much larger and spread out over a much wider area. And if 7,400 missiles launched by Russia against Ukraine, and Ukraine is still, uh, they're struggling, but they are still in this fight, do you think that the West could even supply Ukraine with 7,400 missiles? And do you think it would make more of a difference against a much larger Russia? And the answer is obviously no. Obviously no. It is entirely unrealistic. And it is, it is another fantasy that they are indulging in, not unlike the, the concept of sending Western main battle tanks, uh, striker vehicles, HIMARS, Patriots, uh, Turkish Bayraktar TB2 drones. When was the last time you even heard uh, a TB2 drone mentioned? Not, not in a long while. And this is just the next fantasy that the collective West is indulging in uh, to maintain a false sense of hope to, to keep this conflict dragging along for as long as possible. This is all just for optics. And uh, we see them talking about this in regards to Ukrainian strikes on Belgorod. So Russia is carrying out strikes all across Ukraine. In response, Ukraine is striking at Belgorod. It's a Russian city right across the border, the Ukrainian-Russian border. And they're, they're striking at the town center and they are killing civilians. And the Western media is saying, well, uh, if Ukraine can do this long enough, maybe they can upset the civilian population, create some sort of internal political upheaval. But in actuality, all it's doing is galvanizing Russian society at all levels. Some people might say, well, we can just increase the output of missile production. We, we could just increase missile production and we can match or exceed Russian missile and, and drone strikes. So let me just talk about the state of U.S. 
missile production. We can start off with this article from the National Interest. This is actually by David Axe, who often writes for Forbes. He writes for Forbes. America's Tomahawk cruise missiles is shrinking and fast. It is, uh, is the Navy's plan to upgrade its missile arsenal enough to keep America covered? And the short answer is no. Raytheon builds Tomahawks at a facility in Arizona. Each missile costs the Navy more than $1 million. In 2020, the Navy has around 4,000 Tomahawks. Okay, so 4,000 total in stock. Russia has fired uh, 7,400 missiles of all kinds, but mostly long-range cruise missiles of, of different uh, specifications, uh, and also long-range uh, ballistic missiles. But that number is set to fall as the fleet upgrades some missiles and disposes of others. The U.S. Navy plans to upgrade a whole lot of Tomahawk land attack cruise missiles, potentially more than a thousand of them. The rest, the service wants to dismantle. The result would be a much more capable, but potentially much smaller U.S. cruise missile arsenal. And this is the trend that the U.S. military has followed since the end of the Cold War. Uh, the, the perception of quality uh, at the expense of quantity, and then what they end up actually having is neither quantity nor quality. Now, there are talks and even ongoing efforts to expand U.S. long-range precision missile production of, of all kinds, not just Tomahawk. You have this from Naval News. This was April 2023. U.S. Navy looks to drastically increase missile production Keep in mind when we read through this article and look at these numbers that this isn't about increasing missile production to, to hand them over to Ukraine. This is about preparing for a U.S. provoked war against China in Asia Pacific. The article says the U.S. Navy is looking to drastically increase its procurement of tomahawks and long-range anti-ship missiles. Bundling in the Navy with the Air Force um, they're talking about the, the use of a long-range anti-ship missile called the Joint Air-to-Surface Standoff Missile, JSON. Uh, procurement for a multi-year plan would double the current production rates of the missiles. So they talk about the current production level and then the future production level. We will double production from where we are today, which is a little over 500 combined uh, missiles a, a year, to well over 1,000. They also said that the Tomahawk missile would continue to be produced and they would expand well not that they're going to expand production sixfold but that they would like to expand it sixfold and if you look at different articles and i've put links to them in the video description below they talk about uh, back in 2004 uh, about a multi-year contract where they would be uh, producing about 500 missiles a year so that's probably around where tomahawk cruise missile production is somewhere around 500 missiles a year and if they expanded it sixfold that would be 3,000 missiles a year but again remember they're just talking about that as a goal they're not even taking any measures to achieve that that is an optimistic goal that is very similar to what we hear about the u.s and europe doing in regards to artillery shell production. We would like to match and exceed Russian artillery shell production. Right now, we're nowhere near even matching it. We're not even going to be near matching it three to five years from now, but someday in the future, maybe we can meet or exceed it. That is what they're talking about in terms of Tomahawk cruise missiles. The current reality right now is that the US is not making enough missiles to even match Russia, let alone China. If they do begin making and transferring long-range missiles to Ukraine, that would be depleting the missiles it has on hand for a potential war they would like to fight against China. So this is where Ukraine is at the moment. Their 2023 summer-fall offensive was completely defeated by Russian forces. They are now weaker than they were before. This is what I warned about before the offensive was even launched, that no matter where it ended on the map, Ukrainian forces would be depleted and the West would be unable to replace their losses. And that is exactly where we are right now at the beginning of 2024. 
this uh, strategy, and I've talked about this in previous videos, and I will be talking about it in the near future in future videos, this Ukrainian strategy of digging in, building up over 2024, attempting to isolate Crimea. Again, this is all fantasy. This is not possible. This is the same sort of fantastical thinking that we saw the U.S. engage in in Vietnam in the 60s and 70s, in Afghanistan from 2001 until they withdrew 20 years later. And this is the type of fantastical thinking they engaged in in regards to their proxy war in Syria from 2011 onward. This idea that they could just build an army out of thin air and overthrow the Syrian army. And then when Russia joined, uh, joined into the conflict, intervened on Syria's behalf, the idea that you would be able to fight Russia, Syria, and Iran with this army you were trying to build out of thin air. It is absurd. It is unrealistic. And it demonstrates a complete lack of competence in the, the policy-making circles and foreign policy circles across the collective West. And this same process of fantastical thinking and incompetence is now carrying over to Ukraine, which means this continued war is going to be uh, long, drawn out, and extremely painful, especially for Ukraine. So I will continue keeping track of this conflict. Uh, until then, if you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. Check out the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work. I highly suggest you follow me on Telegram. I'm most active there. I post absolutely everything there, including backups of all of the videos that I put on YouTube and on Rumble. Check the video description below for all of the links that I referenced in this video, as well as for ways you can help support my work. I do not monetize uh, YouTube or any of my other social media platforms. If ads pop up, feel free to skip them. If you do want to support my work, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee and also through Patreon. And to everyone who has been supporting my work, whether it's through one-time donations, donations once a month, or even if you're just sharing my work with others, getting the, the word out there, that is all greatly appreciated. That is what makes this work possible. So thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.